All right, welcome to today's webinar, everyone. We're so glad that you're able to join us today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Lackey and I am the Digital Communication Specialist at the Public Health Law Center. I'm just gonna go through a couple of logistics before we get started. Closed captioning is available on today's webinar. Uh, I will put the uh, link in the chat for the full live transcript. Otherwise you can click the CC icon in the bottom panel of your Zoom window. Just to let you know, all attendees are muted. So you will, we ask that you submit a question using the Q&A box in the bottom panel of your Zoom window. You can submit a question at any time. Also, there will be a webinar evaluation survey after today's webinar, which will pop up when you exit. If um, you take a couple minutes to fill that out, we greatly appreciate it. And also the webinar is being recorded today. So if you miss details or like to share it, a link to the slides and then any resources we just we discuss during the webinar today will be shared uh, with a follow-up email, usually within 48 hours. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Willow Anderson to get us started. Good afternoon, my name is Willow Anderson. I'm an attorney here at the Public Health Law Center and I am joining today our team lead, Desmond Jensen, who leads our FDA team at the Public Health Law Center. Uh, we wanna begin by uh, really thanking and congratulating uh, the, the plaintiffs, the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, the American Medical Association, the National Medical Association, the Action on Smoking and Health for lifting mountains to get us to this point. Uh, and of course, our fearless leaders here at the Public Health Law Center and the organizations who had the foresight to use the citizens petition as a tool to actively engage with our federal government to affect change. And of course, the lawyers and legal team at Pollock Cohen for their hard work and dedication. We are so proud to share in this joint victory with all of you. Uh, however, as you are all well aware, we have not fully achieved victory until menthol cigarettes and cigars are off the shelves. And it's meetings like this that help us to reaffirm our mission and realize that goal. So let's talk cigars, characterizing flavors. What are they? What are they not? What are our talking points on these issues? And how do we get to work? Right off the bat, I want to address a couple of red herring issues and get those out of the way. The tobacco companies, no surprises here, uh, are already inserting themselves with groups asking the FDA to reconsider because a menthol ban, according to commercial tobacco, may increase police interactions with Black Americans. Let us be clear, we have been conscious of this concern from the beginning. We do not and would not support an action that criminalizes tobacco. The FDA has the authority to regulate commercial tobacco products and companies the FDA does not have the authority to criminalize individual use. Commercial tobacco is purposefully capitalizing on civil unrest and uh, racial uh, awareness to further its interest in making money. And the hypocrisy is unbelievable. Big tobacco racially targets groups and then claims to use it as a shield in falsely protecting the same groups it, it targets. We need to nip that messaging in the bud and expose commercial tobacco for what it's really doing, uh, making money off, off lives. The other red herring issue, underground markets. No, <laughs> and here's what big tobacco is pushing, that a menthol ban fosters an underground market. There is no evidence to support that claim. What the evidence does support is that a federal ban on menthols spurs current smokers into successfully quitting saving millions of lives and preventing avoidable diseases. The irrefutable data says that a menthol ban reduces disease and death, the leading cause of preventable death in the United States by reducing youth experimentation and addiction and increasing the numbers of smokers that quit. The underground market argument is false and is another message we need to nip in the bud. And then the other point that I want to hit on before Desmond gets into the nuts and bolts of the rule is we need to communicate that it's essential that the FDA proceed as quickly as possible with this rule without delays. Uh, the Public Health Law Center is urging the FDA to close the 60-day uh, comment period, which is set to expire on July 5th, 2022, and to not extend the comment period beyond 60 days. 
um, you will see that Desmond has created a short YouTube video on our website to learn uh, how you can comment. And he'll be talking about more of that later as well. Um, but the reasons for that is that really the FDA has more than enough information to proceed with rulemaking. Uh, the information collected in this docket is not needed to cross the, the threshold for action. There isn't new information not known to the FDA to be gathered. A short comment period and a short implementation period is not prejudicial to manufacturers or retailers or businesses. They have notice, plenty of notice, and those business entities have had ample opportunity to express their opinions to the FDA and prepare for future action. Finally, the biggest reason of all is that the benefits of this action are measured in lives saved and disease averted, which means that any amount of delay equates to additional lives and more Americans becoming afflicted with debilitating and avoidable disease. So because the FDA is in position of all the relevant data necessary to proceed, uh, we urge the FDA to close the comment period on July 5th, 2022, and not extend uh, that comment period and to implement the rule as soon as possible. Uh, the longer the FDA delays in promulgating the rule, the graver the health consequences. So with that said, I turn to Desmond to talk with you now a little bit more about what is in the rule and other talking points for comment. Desmond. Thanks, Willow. So um, we're doing this webinar today. We're focused on the cigar rule, but I'm, I'm totally aware we did a menthol webinar yesterday, and I'm sure not everyone can attend that one. So we're going to try to prioritize the questions about cigars. I'm, I'm positive people are going to ask about menthol, and there's going to be some overlap. The rules are very similar. There's a reason they're happening at the same time. So just to, to put that out there, that if you have cigar-specific questions, this is the time to ask them for sure. And as Willow mentioned, we have tons of resources on our website, including uh, a video that really shows you how to submit a comment. It's very simple, um, but if you haven't done it before, we will literally walk you through the steps and it's, it's probably much more simple than you, than you may think it would be. So in talking about the cigar rule, I think off the bat, in addition to, to crediting those who worked so hard to get us to this point, I think we also, I, I, I want to make sure that we acknowledge that in promulgating the cigar rule as well, the FDA took an additional step that we hadn't necessarily asked for. Um, when we filed our citizen petition on menthol cigarettes, the FDA wasn't actually regulating cigars then. That didn't happen until a few years later. So the, the petition that was at issue in the litigation was focused on menthol cigarettes. But in granting that petition, the FDA decided to close what would have been an obvious loophole, and that's to eliminate flavored cigars as well. So tremendous credit to the FDA for, for going further than we had asked on that issue. Um, there's a lot to say about the rule. There's a lot to, um, to push the FDA to, to do better. But I think it, it's really important to recognize we, we hadn't asked for the cigar rule. This is something that the FDA understood that this would be an additional necessary measure to protect public health. So for, for all the criticism that we lay on the FDA, we should also give them credit where it's due. So um, the guts of the rule are in, in terms of the actual regulatory language that, that gets codified is very simple. There's not a lot to it. Uh, the FDA says that they're prohibiting characterizing flavors in cigars. Um, and the term characterizing flavor, which if you've done work at the state or local level is probably a term you're familiar with, is not defined here. Um, the FDA does give us some information on how it thinks that it will go about determining which products are have a characterizing flavor and which ones don't. Uh, but it's sort of an ad hoc review. That's not necessarily what you would expect or want to see from an agency that has tremendous resources to really get to the root of the problem. But just like in the menthol rule, the FDA is specifically asking the question of how to, to improve that process and has suggested to us that it wants information on whether it ought to just prohibit the flavor additives entirely rather than trying to figure out what is and what isn't a characterizing flavor. And I think that that's the direction that everyone in public health, public health should be pushing the FDA towards. 
we're all kind of in universal agreement, including the agency, and there's lots of emissions from the industry that combusted commercial tobacco products are the most harmful. And so the addition of anything to those products that makes them easier to use or more appealing is bad for public health. And flavor, flavor additives would probably be near the top of that list. So there's no reason to not push the FDA in that direction. The evidence base for a lot of this focuses on characterizing flavors because that's kind of the easiest way to study. But I know that there is information out there on the actual chemical constituents. And that's the sort of evidence that, that, that people who are experts in that may want to focus on. Um, I will also say to you, I'm sure people know, e-cigarettes are not included in the scope of this rule. And I think I can pretty safely say they won't be in the final rule either. I said this yesterday on the menthol webinar. The way that the FDA's process plays out, what's in the proposed rule and what's in the final rule have to be fairly close together. So if they have not put the e-cigarette industry on notice that their products might be included within the scope of this rule, and then all of a sudden the final rule does, those companies who would have otherwise participated in the process wouldn't. And so the infrastructure of administrative law at the federal level here in the United States does not like that as an outcome. And so uh, I, I, I would not expect e-cigarettes to be included in this rule. And I think you can certainly comment on that if, you're, if you know, you, your purpose is to suggest that the FDA take that action in the future, but it wouldn't happen in the context of this rulemaking. So just to get that out of the way, there are, however, a couple of categories of products that are contemplated in the rule, but not included in the proposal. And those are pipe tobacco and water pipe tobacco. So as I said, there's a recognition that combusted products are the most harmful. We have all flavors except menthol removed from cigarettes. So we have an action for, to remove menthol. And then we have all flavors and cigars. So the remainder of that combusted tobacco category is pipe tobacco and water pipe tobacco. And those products could, I think, based on the language in the rule, be included in the final rule if the FDA determines it has enough evidence. And what, what, it, what the agency says in the rule is that the, the evidence base related to the flavors in those products and the, the impact of those flavors is just not quite as robust as cigars. So. I know there are experts on those issues. And so if you have that sort of information, that would be excellent to put into comments as well. Trying to make sure we're already getting lots of questions and that's awesome. Keep, keep submitting questions. We will try to get through as many as possible. I'm just trying to make sure that we get all of the, I mean, I, like I said, it's actually a fairly simplistic rule. There, there isn't a ton in it to, to really, talk about because it's such a discrete action to, to eliminate the addition of a thing from a product. This isn't like you know lowering nicotine levels where you really have to determine how to make this happen. These are things that aren't inherent in the products, they're added to them. So in order to prevent it from happening, we just stop the addition of the extra thing. So it really is a pretty simple process. Um, I'm starting to turn to the questions, Willow, and I think feel free to jump in and answer any of the ones that you've been looking at but i'm going to i'm going to jump in on one here about what sorts of cigars are included which is something i intended to intended to talk about but um forgot so um the term cigar in federal law is essentially i i believe the exact language is very similar to something like any roll of tobacco that's not wrapped in paper so if it's wrapped in paper, it becomes a cigarette, but if it, or solely paper. So if it's wrapped in anything else, literally anything else, although cigars usually wrapped in tobacco, it becomes a cigar. And so little cigars, as I'm sure most people know, are essentially cigarettes that have tobacco added to the paper wrapper. And that, that small act removes them from the regulatory world of cigarettes and turns them into cigars. So most people, I think, probably think about cigars as being little cigars. Packs of 20 look like cigarettes. Cigarillos or small cigars. Um, products like Swisher Sweets, Black and Mild, sold in packs of one, two, three, four, five sometimes. Almost all of them have fruit and candy flavors. And then you have premium cigars. 
those are usually sort of the 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 products that you think of like you know old white men in their smoking jackets drinking brandy and smoking cigars very large usually very expensive so this rule covers all of the cigars that the fda regulates and the caveat there is people may remember there was litigation challenging the deeming rule and that's the rule that allows the fda to regulate cigars and one of those cases, um, the court determined that the FDA didn't quite provide enough evidence to justify its regulation of premium cigars. And there's so there's a carve out in that litigation for so-called premium cigars. And the issue is remanded to the FDA. So the FDA has to either uh, issue a new rule that would provide the evidence to regulate or amend the rule and permanently exclude premium cigars. So it, that definitely feels like an exemption. But the way that premium cigars are defined is fairly tight. And one of the things that makes a cigar a premium cigar is that it doesn't have any added flavors to it. And so this rule touches all of the products that have added flavors that are cigars. So even if FDA was robustly regulating so-called premium cigars, any that have added flavor aren't premium cigars and FDA is including them in the rule. Hopefully that makes sense. I know that's a little, a little odd in terms of, of what's, uh, what is and isn't regulated, but the, the overlap between premium cigars that FDA doesn't regulate and flavored cigars that does regulate is zero. There's nothing in that category. And so there, there isn't really an exemption for premium cigars in the flavor rule because they, they aren't there to begin with. Hopefully that, <laughs> I know that's a little bit confusing, um, but hopefully that Essentially, makes sense. yes, in the chat to, to yes. Liz's question. So the answer is- <laughs> The short yes, answer, probably yes. <laughs> Except for premium, which is already defined as not having those characterizing flavors. So essentially, yes, it covers all cigars. Yes, and I, I, I'm already seeing follow-up questions. So all, if, if the rule as written were implemented as the FDA has intended, once that rule goes into place, there would no longer be any cigars on the market that have flavor added to them. Uh, hope, hopefully that <laughs> maybe that way of saying it is a little bit clearer. Um, let's see. I know I see a couple of questions about um, like the level of evidence, what types of evidence to submit. Um, and so you'll, you'll find some of that in the, in the short video that we have on our website, which if, if you have never submitted a comment to the FDA, I would encourage you to watch it. It's only like, I don't know, seven minutes long. It, we try to make it as short as possible. But I will say that um, just generally for everyone who's, who's on right now, the FDA is a regulatory agency. They think a lot about the evidence base. So as much as you can root your comments in science or data, that is great. That doesn't mean that you have to be referencing you know, the peer reviewed publications. I know there are plenty of people from state and local health departments and you're doing all kinds of data collection at the state and local level. And it's, it's not for the purpose of publication. It's so that you know what's going on in your community, but that data that you've collected is also data that's that's useful in this context. So any place in the country where you've implemented a policy similar to this or contemplated a policy and gathered evidence about it, all of that stuff is good and, and all of it is relevant in your comments to the FDA. You know, it, it, it doesn't hurt to just submit a comment that says we think this is great, good job FDA. But I think if you if your goal is to shape the outcome of the rule as much as you can provide evidence for the suggestions for change, I think that's probably the, the most effective way to, to really move policy forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think the question was, does the FDA need additional comments if it already has all the information? So I should clarify, we are urging the FDA to not extend the comment period beyond 60 days because the FDA um, has ample data, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't comment. We are definitely encouraging uh, groups and, and constituencies to comment. And um, I'd point out too, there is uh, some talking points on our website that can go, th that helps, um, gives you some suggestions of different kinds of comments that you may want to consider posting depending on, um, you know, what your group what your group's interests are. 
we have more qu more questions about premium cigars and I'm, I'm gonna uh, i'm i and i'm not i'm not saying that because i'm like oh, i explained it already i it's it's confusing and i i my goal here is to clear up confusion so if it lingers keep keep asking the keep asking the questions so the 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 definition that i was referencing of premium cigars comes out of that litigation and it's not something that the fda is it's not the fda necessarily drawing the lines that court looked to the fda's definition when they were contemplating the deeming rule where they they asked the the public should we exempt premium cigars and they 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 created a, a pot like this is the definition we might use they didn't go with that but the court that decided that those products should be excluded looked to that definition but the court is telling the FDA the products that it can't regulate without some change to the evidence or submission of more evidence um, for the rule. So there's nothing there's nothing in this rulemaking process that you can tell the FDA to, to think about the definition differently because that order is coming from from a court. So it's not going to the what isn't isn't a premium cigar that determines whether FDA regulates it isn't isn't within the scope of this rulemaking. And I, there's another question here about, could you add flavors to premium cigars in the future? So we have these products that aren't regulated. You have the rule come down and remove flavors from the other products. So you have these unregulated products. Can you add flavors to them? And the answer is no, because the moment you add flavors to them, they're no longer a premium cigar. And then they fall into the category covered by this rule. So hopefully hopefully that's clear it, there is really a, a clear separation here it it feels like an exemption i've said this to, to lots of people in the last week or so it really feels like an exemption it feels like there's something there that we should uh really think hard about and push the fda on but it, because adding a flavor removes a product from that unregulated category it really there really isn't an exemption i mean i think that the fda should really uh, be making sure that that's what's happening with those products, but but the the actual structure of the rule is fine with with that exemption being there. Um, okay, so what else? There's do we have? a number of questions here about characterizing flavor. The definition of that um, is there one, and is there a definition that the tobacco control community supports? What do you think, Desmond? Is this a good time sh to shift uh, into the, into that discussion? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, that the the issue of of defining the term characterizing flavor is one that that we've all known about for for quite some time. I'm I'm a little disappointed. Well, more maybe more than a little disappointed that the FDA didn't either define that term or put more meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, I, I know the goal for the FDA is to ensure the, the maximum amount of regulatory flexibility. And, and that I understand that as a goal. And I think I, I phrased things this way yesterday as well. There's a, there's a degree of regulatory flexibility where you risk bordering on the arbitrary. And if you have created this sort of ad hoc process that doesn't provide enough notice to regulated industry, or to the public about how the government determines what products are prohibited and what aren't prohibited, you're really taking a risk in someone challenging that and a federal judge siding with the challenger. So our the way that we're thinking about this in the context of our own comments, um, right now, I think the, the cleanest way for the FDA to structure this rule and the menthol rule is to completely forget about what is and isn't a characterizing flavor and just to prohibit the flavor additives entirely. Now for menthol, it's fairly discreet because we're talking about one flavor. I know that in cigars, there's, there's you know probably hundreds, if not thousands of, of additives that could be considered flavor. But if there's one governmental body in the United States that can figure that out, it's the FDA, because they already, theoretically, because manufacturers are required to give it to them, should know the ingredients and constituents of every cigar that's on the market right now. So anything in those products that's not tobacco and, you know, are the types of, of chemicals that we know impart a flavor, 
can be prohibited from the products. The FDA really can drill down to, to manufacturing in a way that state and local governments who've been grappling with this issue can't in quite the same way. And the FDA really has the resources to do the sorts of laboratory testing and things it takes to enforce a rule like that as well. So in our comment to the FDA, that is what we'll present as the gold standard. Eliminate the flavor additives entirely. The alternative is to, to accept characterizing flavor as the, the way forward, but to really think through what that means with a little more detail. Now, in the context of menthol, I think what I said yesterday is there's menthol in almost all cigarettes on the market, which was news to some people. But if you, if you look at the levels of menthol in cigarettes, there's a clear division between those that are marketed as menthol cigarettes and those that are not marketed as menthol cigarettes. And so the FDA could certainly decide there's a level of menthol that crosses the threshold for characterizing flavor. And you can do the same thing with cigars and all of the other flavors, strawberry, peach, citrus, you know, whatever it is. You know, it probably would take some, certainly some figuring out, but I'm willing to bet that a lot of scientists have already figured out a lot of this, but you can drill down into each individual constituent and decide what level of that constituent is acceptable and not acceptable, um, which gets back to the original point of if, if, if that's the case and we know all the constituents just prohibit them entirely, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, but we could, if we, if, if FDA decided we'll allow some of it, just not all of it, the FDA can set exactly what the level should be and, and enforce at that level. So um, we haven't necessarily put a definition of the term characterizing flavor out there that we um, sort of want people to, to sign on to or anything like that. We, I'm sure we'll try to come up with something um, but I, I think that it's not necessarily important for the FDA to see the same definition, the same terms repeated in, in comments over and over and over again. I think what, what we ought to do collectively is to point out the flaws in what's been proposed and suggest that the FDA attempt to do it better. And then hopefully there are plenty of individuals and groups who will have you know, little bits and pieces that the FDA can put together and, and create something better. Um, be as comprehensive as, as you want to be in your individual comments on that issue in particular. I don't know, Will, if you have anything to- Yeah, I think add. that's, I mean, that's, um, well, well, well responded to that, that when we get into the, the, the nuances of what is and isn't a characterizing definition, it makes a lot of sense to just say no additives. Um, there's follow up about the definition of cigar in the chat. Um, what do you do you mean that premium cigars are exempt? So technically, they're not exempt. They're just not listed in the new proposed rule. But the definition of premium cigar by definition can't have a characterizing flavor. Hopefully that's clear. <laughs> so it's technically ever... not exempted. It's just not listed. But by definition, a premium cigar doesn't include a characterizing flavor. And if it did, then it's not a premium cigar. So premium cigars are not exempted by this rule. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one to conceptualize. And I, I'm, we're sort of like running out of ways to say the same <laughs> thing, I feel like. But so I think the, like the best way I can explain it is that if you, if you are adding flavor to the product, it's no longer a premium cigar. So by definition, right. And so any, any product that's out there that has a flavor in it is covered by this rule. So it, even though, even though a manufacturer could call it a premium cigar, or it's a product that people would think of as a premium cigar, the addition of flavor means that it's not for this purpose and any a, other definition out there doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Right. And the, there's a follow up to that. Our premium cigars defined differently at the state level. I don't think they are right there. They, that's um, the federal government. Well, um, I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, there, there may be states that have a definition of that term for a specific state purpose. 
but really the only the only definition that the FDA is working with is is the one that that a court handed to it in this context. So um, hopefully it's 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 clear to people that I mean, as I said before, and I think maybe this is the other way to conceptualize it that's clear. If this rule is implemented, there are no longer any cigars with flavors added to them. They would they would all be removed from the market, whether they're big, whether they're small, whether they're expensive, whether they're cheap. It, it wouldn't matter. All of them that have added flavors would be gone. Okay, we're back to the definition. <laughs> so, um, will you please talk? Okay, essentially, premium cigars. Okay, the proposed rule does not list premium cigars. Period. <laughs> However, the definition of a premium cigar, uh, by definition, it doesn't include those, um, those flavors. So hopefully that addresses the question. It is, uh, it is a, tough, um, a tough thing to explain, for sure. Um, and I see stuff in the, in the chat as well as the, the Q&A. Um, Yeah, I, I I like Peggy's comment in the chat. If you add Kool-Aid to water, it's not water anymore, right? Then it's Kool-Aid. So if you add flavor to a premium cigar, it's not a premium cigar anymore. It's a totally That's different right. thing. And it's captured by this rule. Great analogy. See, it, lawyers always try to like dig into the details and try to like explain to you the language. That's that's a that's a the, probably a better uh, analogy than I could have come up with. Um Okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, Sally, I see your question too. Even if a state decided this is or isn't a premium cigar, the FDA is regulating manufacturers. And so there's nothing that a state can do, a state or a local or a tribal government could do that would allow products on the market that the FDA has determined can't be there. So. There's, there's nothing you can craft at, at the lower level of government that creates an exemption to this sort of policy. So even if you had some real tricky definition of premium cigar at any state level, those products aren't being manufactured anymore. So they don't, they don't come back onto the market just because of some crafty definition at the state level. Hopefully that's clear also. Um, I did see a question about sort of the crossover between this and cannabis. And that is another one that is sometimes hard to answer, a little bit tricky. Um, so the, the cigar products that people end up using in the consumption of cannabis, if they're sold as cigars, they're covered under this rule. If you have products that are sort of designed for consumption of cannabis and their use with, with tobacco is sort of ancillary, they probably won't be because those, it, the FDA is really, it's because it's regulating at the manufacturing level. Um, it is really thinking about what products are tobacco products and what products are cannabis and the federal government is attempting to not <laughs> do any kind of regulation of cannabis, as you probably know. Um, but that said, if there are products that are, you know, on their face are, are said they're being marketed at, for cannabis, and they're clearly not, they're clearly a way to avoid a rule like this, the FDA can look to how they're, how they're marketed, how they're used, their intended use. And so um, as long as FDA is doing some decent retail surveillance and sort of following what the market is doing that is not necessarily going to be a, a big loophole either for the most part uh hopefully that's and and you know have as much faith in the fda's enforcement as you as you would but it's it's the way that the rule is designed that that shouldn't create a big loophole uh let's see what else willow um, I see a question, there was a question that came in very early about, um, illicit trade. Oh. And I, I mean, we can definitely say more about that if people want to talk about it. Um, and we covered a lot of this on the, in the menthol 
webinar yesterday. So if you if you didn't if you were not able to attend that one, the recording will be up on our website if it if it isn't already. Um, I think so. Illicit trade. We are we are calling that out as sort of an industry red herring. That's an industry talking point, and they've been using it for a long time for various policies. Uh, and it's it's one that is attractive because uh, people understand it, and it does really seem like it's you know a, a dangerous unintended consequence, right? So, in the United States, most most um, most commercial trade that we would call illicit trade is actually the legal sale of primarily cigarettes in jurisdictions that have low tax rates and low prices. And then the move and Ill illicit resale of those products in places that have higher taxes and higher prices. I genuinely don't know how much that happens with cigars. I know it's fairly common with cigarettes, or at least it has been historically. Um, so information about that sort of illicit trade, evidence related to that is really irrelevant when you're talking about federal regulation because then we don't have the same, we're not talking about interstate resale of products, we're talking about regulating manufacturers and eliminating the products from the market entirely. So in this case, you really have to have either illicit manufacturing of the products, which I mean is possible, but FDA can certainly inspect facilities that manufacture tobacco products, including cigars. Um, so as long as FDA is, is doing that, there shouldn't be much of that. And, and the FDA should take enforcement action if, if that is happening. Or you have to have cross-border smuggling, which again also happens. But like I said yesterday with, with, with menthol cigarettes, it's hard to imagine there being a lot of smuggling across the border and at ports of entry for products like tobacco products that have much lower value compared to other products that get smuggled across the border. And the idea that there could be an illicit market that is able to fulfill the demand, the like current demand for things like menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars is crazy. I mean, we're talking about the smuggling of trillions of units of products across the border. And it just, it's just wholly impossible. Will there be some illicit trade? I have no doubt. But the idea that like in every metropolitan area in the country, there'll be back alleys where people are selling menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars is just fantasy. It does not exist. So hopefully um, if people are hearing those sorts of, of things, they can shut them down very quickly. There's also a question here. Do we yeah. have a list of all the national organizations who assisted in getting to this place so far, um, supported the citizens petition and all the national organizations who have signaled their support of the FDA menthol and cigar flavor bans? I'm, una I'm unaware of one particular list, but I think certainly the signatories on the citizens petition and the lawsuits um, would be a good place to start. Um, to compile that information. Like I said, I don't know of one particular list, but those who have signed on to the citizens petition and um, supported the, the legal action, I think um, is included right there in those legal documents. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, if you if you go back and look at the, like Willow said, the, the petition lists all the organizations that signed it and it's, you know, it's it's all the big organizations that you would that you would imagine. And then there's sort of a, a subset of those groups who sued the FDA to get action on the petition. I don't think I've seen any public health group in opposition to this either action. Um, it's, you know, I, like I said, like Will said, I don't know that there's like one list where it's all compiled, but it, it is a tremendously long list of, of groups who support this. I, the only groups I'm aware of that are, that have come out against it are ones that are funded by the tobacco industry. So not surprising. Um, I, I realize I should have mentioned also, I mean, I think in the context of, of illicit trade and like illicit trade as a way to fulfill demand, I think it's important to really also think about the cessation opportunity. I mean, the fact of the matter is there are, there's a significant amount of people who consume menthol cigarettes or consume flavored cigars who are going to quit. I mean, demand will go down. That is, that part is inevitable. And the FDA also is in a position to 
improve this as a cessation opportunity, as a as a uh, an agency that has uh, that also regulates cessation treatments and that has that works closely with you know CDC and SAMHSA and other other federal agencies that are right there um, assisting in cessation efforts. So one of the things we asked for in the original menthol petition was um, to also for the FDA to to improve what it does with respect to cessation so that this really is the opportunity that we hope it is. And so, I, I mean, that's true in the context of cigars as well. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure, and that that's worth discussing in your comments as well. It's not, I mean, it's discussed in the rule makings, but it's not something that gets codified because it's not something the FDA needs a rule to do. There are a lot of non-rule actions the FDA can take to improve access to cessation services, culturally specific cessation services for both users of menthol cigarettes and users of flavored cigars. So um, let's not forget that in our comments as well. There's another question. Does the FDA response fail to address the lawsuit? Um, the day before yesterday, we had the, we had, um, the, the plaintiffs um, do a webinar which is also posted on our website. So that's still, um, I, I can't, the, the, certainly it appears that the FDA's actions were responsive to the lawsuit, but I can't say that they specifically addressed anything in the promulgated proposed rules or in the proposed rules that specifically addresses the lawsuit. Um, that's still somewhat of an open question. They have an early court date in June, right, Desmond? Um, Yes, I believe so. I, so I, I'm, yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to, to watch the webinar that the plaintiffs did, because I, I believe they discussed this. Um, but the, the lawsuit is still pending. That court is hearing the government's motion to dismiss and could grant it. But the nice thing here is um, the, the FDA granted the citizen petition. So that means that it has decided it will go through the rulemaking process. And so the proposal is not a rule. So if the FDA delays a significant amount and the case has been dismissed, those plaintiffs can refile their lawsuit and the court can examine whether or not FDA's delay of the final rule is something that's illegal and the court should oversee. So even if the lawsuit is dismissed now, that doesn't mean that there's no longer leverage on this issue. That's um, something that remains to be seen. But I, I think that for now, we should probably focus on the comment period and really making sure that the FDA feels the, the pressure to, to act quickly. I see a question, I see a question from Cheryl Bellis and I, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think that, uh, so the question is about, do we have evidence, like I just, I just went through a long spiel about illicit trade and was like, there, it's not gonna happen, right? And no, it's, it's not that, what I, what I said isn't really based on any evidence because you can't have evidence to support a negative uh, conclusion, right? So when you hear from industry, from others, from anyone who's opposing this rule and they say, ah, oh, there's gonna be all this illicit trade, what you say is, what is your evidence? Because they're going to struggle because the evidence that we have about illicit trade out in the world right now, a lot of it is about, like I said, the legitimate sale and then illicit resale products within the United States across state borders, or the evidence comes from Europe. And the European market for tobacco products is very different than the American market. In Europe, not every country has manufacturing facilities and so the products have to cross borders as a part of the ordinary uh, chain of custody of the products. In the United States, for cigarettes at least, and probably for most flavored cigars and maybe not all, but most, the products are manufactured here and they never cross a border. So the evidence about illicit smuggling in Europe doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's a square peg in a round hole here. So uh, the FDA did a, um, a sort of compilation of what it knows about illicit trade related to its own product standards back in 2018, I think. I think it came out the same time as the advanced notices of proposed rulemaking on nicotine reduction and whether FDA should regulate premium cigars. And then the second ANPRM related to menthol cigarettes and flavors. 
And I think we'll try to dig that up and put a link on our website, but it's a really good um, analysis. You know, what I gave you was like just off the top of my head and not really based in, in actual numbers or anything like that. But the FDA did a sort of analysis of what does illicit trade look like if we do a coast to coast regulation? And it's 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 probably more more of what would, <laughs> would help you, Cheryl, than just me saying what I've said. But again, I think that whenever you hear the opposition, you you must put the onus on them. You provide it. If you suspect that there will be a particular outcome, the burden is on you to provide evidence that it will happen, not on not on us to establish that it won't happen. We are getting super close to to time. We are like right up there. Are there any other sort of lingering questions that we can dispense with. You know, one, one thing that I should have mentioned that in the context of illicit trade in particular is that the FDA has vast authority when it comes to creating a track and trace program. It is contemplated by the Tobacco Control Act. And there's also a citizen petition that the FDA has been sitting on almost as long as the menthol petition to ask it to, to do, to create a track and trace program. So FDA has authority to figure out how to track products from the time they come off the assembly line until they are end up in the hands of a consumer. And so the FDA really has the tools to understand illicit and legitimate trade within the United States. And it's something that the FDA could do, should have done a long time ago and would certainly make it hard for industry to, to argue that illicit trade will swallow the benefits of everything that the FDA proposes. The longer FDA puts that off, the more we have to deal with the, the illicit trade argument on everything in the future. So any, who do you think, Willow, any final? Yeah, final other thoughts, than final? Um, what you're all doing at the local and state levels is really important to continue yes. as well. We anticipate um, even best case scenario that this rule, best case scenario won't be implemented for quite a while. So um, keep, keep doing what you're doing. And um, uh, we are available here for technical assistance or questions. If you want to talk about the definition of premium cigars some more, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are happy to help in any way we can. Absolutely. All right. Um, again, go to our website, check out our resources absolutely feel free to reach out. We are, we are thrilled to help people navigate this process. It's, it's daunting if you haven't done it, but it's really very simple and we will walk you through all the steps. So thank you everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.